What's up, bros? Welcome to the Men of Mind podcast. I'm Omar Bravo, and this is the podcast all about badass knack bros and their journeys through life. From the bad beats and the lessons learned, to the mountaintop successes and advice they'd give their younger selves, this is your chance to get to know these bros better. In this episode, I talk with Jason Navarro, Alpha Chapter Beta Class Number 19 from San Jose State University. Orale. So, Mr. Navarro, thank you so much for uh, joining me. Uh, you're actually going to be the first uh, non-Ada chapter bro to be on the show. So that's a that's a big deal. And you were shouted out by uh, Ruben Villa. He said, man, you got to talk to this guy. So uh, so here we are, brother. It's only because we're neighbors. I, yeah, I, he's... I can hear his interview. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for having me. And I, I went down the list of uh, the next that you've already interviewed and uh i I can think of stories of each of with with each of them so it's kind of cool um probably mostly sean john because you know helping being part of starting that santa clara chapter was was a big deal for us as max you know back in the day um i sent you a couple pictures showing you pictures of john with hair just to kind of take you back because i saw his interview and he's talking about his lack of hair He's still ugly, but yeah, I mean, he had hair back then, so. Some things never change. <laughs> yeah, some things never change. <laughs> so yeah, That's man, I'm ready. Yeah. Me, so get whatever I got. Absolutely, absolutely. So we, we've been starting every one of these the, the exact same way, just to get kind of a, a level set. And it's, um, are you uh, married with kids, single and ready to mingle, or somewhere in between? I'm married with kids. I've been married for... This is our 25th year. We've been together. This is our 31st year. My wife is a uh, member of Lambda Sigma Gamma from Santa Barbara. She was one of their founding mothers down there. We got together eons ago and we've been best friends ever since. And kind of, I don't know what life would be like without her. It's just, you know, just time wise, but uh, definitely my best friend. and my road dog and the person that, you know, knows how to push all my buttons and (laughs) also to motivate me, you know, Uh, we have two beautiful children. I have a a daughter who is 22. Uh, She just finished up at uh, UCLA. She finished early there. She's now at Stanford, uh, just finished all her academics, getting into the research piece of her master's program. And then I have a son who is 16. Okay. He'll be 17 in like a month, two months, whatever that is, August. Um, Six foot one. He's like way taller than me. He must have a different dad because I'm not tall. <laughs> no, all the uh, all the men on my wife's side are tall. So luckily he got that gene. So he's towering over all of us. And then, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of it. He's a big golfer. I'm a golf coach. So... Um, he's a big golfer on the team and team captain. I didn't pick him. His, his peers picked him. I picked somebody else. They, <laughs> they said, no, I, I picked a senior because he's not a senior. And the senior's like, nah, you got to give it to him. He's already the leader, you know, <laughs> just let him have it. So it's kind of cool. But yeah. Two kids, the house, the dogs, you know. Yeah. That's fantastic, man. I, first off, I want to congratulate you on the 25 years and 31 years. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. I mean, 50% of us don't, don't make it there. So, so, and, and even so it's not, nothing's guaranteed forever. Still like you still got to put in the hard work every day. Right. I mean, to make yeah, it, to... Man, it's not easy. I mean, there's, there's plenty of times I mess it all up. I mean, just over <laughs> dinner last night, you know, it was my turn to cook and I just, I just wasn't in the mood and she's like, we're not eating out. And I said, Oh, we are. <laughs> so she ran, she went and ran errands and I ordered food while she was out. So just kind of solve that. But you know, when you have, when you only have that as your problems, like you can deal with that, you know, that that's not problems. It's when you got trust issues or finance issues or overspending and someone not sharing, those are big issues, man, that you got to get through. So um, communication is definitely the key that we've, that's helped us, you know, whether we've had to check ourselves and talk to each other about tone and facial expressions and, you know, all that stuff, but uh, definitely we, we communicate and we've gotten better over time to now it's like, Oh, Oh God, man, she made that face. I probably shouldn't have said that, you know? So, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it, 
definitely been, you know, a roller coaster ride. Both of us should tell you the exact same. But I wouldn't rather be anywhere else, you know. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they call it fighting good fight for a reason. Right. Right. I think uh, the the thought that just came to my mind right now was thinking about um when I was an undergrad and I looked up to the older guys or even the the old guys if you will. Like I was 18 and the old guys were like 24, 25. <laughs> Right. right the the maybe maybe there was a founder somewhere that was like 30 or something like that but to think about the resources that that the undergrads have now in order right. to look up and talk to people that are who have children their same age who um who are about to be em- empty nesters and and the likes it's it's a whole whole different ball game what a let's 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 talk about a little bit about that um what year did you graduate what year did you cross I crossed in uh, 1991. I know you probably weren't even born then. Nah, I crossed in 99. So okay, we're... good. <laughs> Not that old. No, I'm old. I uh, graduated in 96. Yeah. Um, went back, uh, did a little bit more work. It's kind of weird. My My degree changed in between. So I had a PE degree, right? No one ever wanted that. And then they they were in the process while I was there of trying to get changed over to kinesiology. Mm. And so um, by the time that all happened a couple of years later, I asked, like, hey, I'd, I'd like to get my, my degree to be that instead. And so I had to take a couple classes. And so I did that, finished that up, and then continued going to school to get my master's. Um, so, yeah, the, the, just kind of a, a weird road to, to start taking, you know. Now, if if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, do you have you have your PhD? I don't I have two years. I um I stopped almost going. have your PhD. Yeah, well, for those that have their PhD, they'll tell you that's not almost like the research <laughs> piece of the dissertation is the toughest piece. Academics, it's easy; it's all laid out for you. Just go to class and and do the work, you know. But it's the research piece and putting all that together. So I don't want people the, like yourself that say, oh, man, you're almost there. I'm like, oh, that's not almost, man. I did the easy part of it. I'll put, put it that way. That's the easy stuff. And so, um, yeah, I, I stopped doing that uh, when I realized that I, I needed to start focusing on the kids more and their you know, collegiate road. Um, and, uh, you know, really it was about the money because it was expensive and trying to pay for our, our our whole agreement, my wife and I, when we got together early, we wanted to pay for our kids to do their undergrad so that they didn't have to worry about that. And whatever they did after was on them, but at least set them up for success and not have to worry about those bills and, and that piece. Um, and so, you know, in doing that, I said, I, I can't focus on myself. It's not my time. It's it's the kid's time. And so my daughter's been pushing me to go back um, to finish up. And I'm like, I don't even know what I would do for research now. You know, my my whole brain is like in a completely different place. And so um, she's really, you know, I mean, she's a grown, not grown, but a young woman, you know, like what she says and the things she says, I really listen to because she's, she's coming across with a lot of education behind her now and trying to push me to finish my goal. Cause that was my goal is for both of us to have our doctorates. <laughs> and then in the, in the, in the interim of that, my brother got his. And so he beat me to it. <laughs> so she's like, well, Tio has his and I'm going to have mine. So you, you know, you're going to have to step up dad. And I was like, nah, I really don't. I'm, I'm getting ready to retire. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really <laughs> need it. So, but yeah, it's nice having that, uh, your child now be your motivator, you know, as you've been in there behind them, whether it be behind the stroller or pushing them onto the field, soccer, whatever it may be, it's now nice to have that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, two years whatever the research piece of it is shy, but uh, I did finish the academic stuff. It, it taught so, me a lot. So go ahead. It sounds pretty obvious that the, that education is a huge emphasis in, in your family, not just in your, your current immediate family, but if your brother went and got a PhD, where did, where did that come from? Were your parents, did your parents go to college? Uh, both of my parents did like JC stuff. My dad, um, he was originally going to uh, Sac State, I think it was, 
and he wanted to be an architect. And then while he was wow. there, he was really good with numbers. And while he was there, he actually got into a firm and was working with them and didn't finish his degree. And then being a, a product or, you know, a young man in the seventies, that party and changed everything. And he actually kind of left our life for a while. Uh, but the academics on my mother's side, I was the first to go to college. Okay. And so there was no influence. You know, my mom did the JC stuff, but you know, the big college first to graduate. Um, so it was a very different, different timetables on my father's side. Most of his siblings went to college, graduated. It was kind of an expected thing. And funny that all of my generation on my father's side, so all of my cousins, it's only my brother, my sister, and I who have our degrees. All of them decided to do other things, military, mm -hmm. um, mechanics, design, like, you know, just kind of went on their own entrepreneurial stuff, but really no, no, no one else went to college. So it's kind of, it's kind of a trip. That is, that, that is really interesting, especially hearing. So are your parents from, I guess, California, not, not necessarily San Jose, but no, my mother is from Texas. She came okay. um, at a very young age. Uh, my grandmother, also born in Texas. Um, they, they, whole, they were in Texas since it was Mexico. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that whole was there, right? And so mm -hmm. my grandmother came. Kind of funny, you know, years later, you find out stories that weren't true. My grandmother was like, <laughs> you know, you believed everything she said. And, and she's been, she's passed for many, many years. But you hear things now, it's like, grandma wasn't telling the truth, you know? And so uh, it's kind of funny. Like recently, my mom, she did that uh, whole 23andMe or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Whichever yeah, the one DNA. And she found out she had nine siblings. Wow. And so. How many did she think she had? She, well, she has two siblings from my grandmother, you know, a previous marriage. But she had nine from another, whole another family. And she's right in the middle. And so we're like, oh, that's kind of weird. So she finally connected with, you know, some of the, uh, some of her siblings and the, one of the, one of the aunts, she came out to my house. Um, she, she's like, yeah, she's like, we grew up knowing we had another sister, um, but we weren't able to talk about it. And it was because my grandfather, who my grandma had said passed mm. in a big rig accident. So we didn't know he existed. He just died a couple of years ago. Like, I mean, he was super old, but we didn't know. Right. But he got hurt on the job and was in the hospital. My grandma was a nurse and they hooked up <laughs> and there was my mom in between the other nine siblings. So it was kind of like taboo to talk about this other, you know, sister that was in the family. So, but it's kind of cool for her, man, to see her connecting with her family, you know, that she's wanted for so, so many years. She knew, had heard from other families, there's, you know, something out there. And yeah, and it's it's uh it's been a long road for her, so I, I'm happy to see. But you know that that family that lineage goes you know back to the 1800s in Texas. So yeah, um, just kind of crazy to hear those stories now that you know I'm you know 50 years old and still learning about who I am, and now learning even more about the past. And it's kind of crazy to see, like wow, that's my family out there, you know. And it's a crazy. What's even worse is that I don't look a lot like my dad's family. And then um, when my Tia Mimi, she came over, um, she started crying. I'm like, oh, are you okay? And she's like, you look just like my dad. I'm like, wow. Oh. And so she brought pictures of like, oh, man, yeah, I, I really do good. look like him. So that was kind of a trip, too, to see like, oh, we, we actually are family, you know? And so even at, like I say, even at 50, you can still be just, you know, kind of blown off the earth of information you'll learn about yourself, you know? So that, that yeah, is so, that is really wild. Yeah. So that that's my mom. My father is from Panama. And so okay. um, he was born and raised till he was 13. And then my grandmother left. She met a GI. Um, uh, my grandfather, Grandpa Cox, that uh, kind of took all of my uh, aunts and uncles and my dad in. There was four of them. And then they had an additional four, I believe it was on their own but he you know took her out of panama and brought her to the united states and um they you know originally moved to florida and then kind of ventured through the military okay and ended up in california so 
Yeah, that, that was kind of a crazy. And her too, she had a bunch of secrets that we found out after she passed. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. The grandmas had all these secrets and you find them out. And, and my grandpa's still alive. And he's like, yeah, I, I, I'd want to tell you, but yeah, I didn't want to get in trouble. Like she'd get me in trouble. I just, I keep those secrets for her. He's like, I won't say him. He's like, but if you ask, I won't lie. So we, you know, bombarding <laughs> questions now, you know? Yeah, so that's kind of funny. But So yeah, so I, I got a, a Panamanian in me and then, you know, a Mexican in me through Texas, whatever you want to call it, Mexican sure. American, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, that's where the, the parents are from. That's a, that's kind of a perfect storm that had to happen for them to end up in, in California, I guess, I'm guessing like Sacramento area is it sound yeah. like in yeah, Sac- it was the Sacramento area. I was uh, born in Sacramento. We left Sacramento when I was eight into San Jose, uh, cause my grandma was here in San Jose. Uh, my mom had kind of ventured up and then we came back and then I was in San Jose most of my life until we bought our first home. We moved down to Salinas for a little bit. And then, uh, I was doing the commute from Salinas to San Jose. It was just too much. You know, that hour commute was just too much. And so we had always talked about, man, we could just live in Gilroy. It's halfway. It's perfect. And one day, Across the street, one of my best friends used to live across the street. And we were at his house having a barbecue. And he's like, hey, man, that house is for sale. I was like, what? And I was like, man, it's the, it was so it's the same exact layout of the house that we had in Salinas. And he had always <laughs> said, like, man, if we could just have this house and move it here. It was like, oh, my God, here's this opportunity. So I called Miguel, one of our bros from, from, uh, from San Jose State. And I said, hey, bro, there's a house I'd like to look at. He's like, you sure you want it? Blah, blah, blah. I'll come down. So we came down. It was in foreclosure or getting ready to go to foreclosure. And um, he's like, you want it? And I was like, I want it. And he's like, but I don't have the money. He's like, do you want it? I said, yeah. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll get it for you. So we, uh, we went in and we called the people on the, on the you know, documentation and we brought it out of foreclosure and he did all his legal stuff and the paperwork and blah, blah, blah. So it was just really signing and agreeing to numbers and he, you know, he really actually lent me the money as well. So it was about seventy-five thousand dollars. Wow! He lent me to to bring it out of foreclosure. And then I sold my house. I want to say in a week, the Salinas house in a week, and paid all that and just dumped all the money. So there's no capital gain stuff or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then boom, there we were. We just, I mean, it took yeah. like the turnaround was so fast. The turnaround was so fast. We didn't have anywhere to live in between getting out of that house and getting into this one, I think it was like three weeks. And so I didn't want the family because this house had been kind of destroyed. Like they just let it go. They weren't clean or doing anything and there was garbage all over. And so my buddy across the street, he had an extra room. He's like, Hey, you guys can stay here. So at the time I only had my daughter. So it was my wife and my daughter. I was like, well, the girls can stay there. I'll stay in this house and continue. Get it right. Get it ready. So I moved in one couch. It was right in the middle of the family room and I would sleep on the couch <laughs> and just go over there and eat and do everything over there. But I would come back and sleep here. So it's, you know, one of those things that you, you kind of deal with, you know, to those sacrifices. It, it's funny because uh, when you um, are in the midst of those sacrifices, it doesn't, you don't, you don't see the gravity of it. It's just like, Hey, I'm just doing what I have to do because right. that's what I have to do. Like, this is what the world is asking of me right now. So I do it. But then in retrospect, when you look back, it's like, that was so crazy. That was just a nuts time. And we were making decisions. And if we saw the full picture, would we have made the same decisions or, you know, there was a whole bunch of trust, a whole bunch of faith. We were just kind of almost on autopilot a lot of times. Yeah. You know, I wasn't even showering here. Um, I was showering over there. So I would just walk across with, you know, just regular swim trunks and a towel to go shower <laughs> and then just kind of walk back. And I had like my, my bags just right by the couch and blankets. And I mean, really all I was doing is changing and sleeping here. That was pretty much it. And it was just the process because the people had, um, they were kind of hoarders. And so the garage was just stuffed, stuffed full, but it was also all over the house and it was just super dirty. But I couldn't get anybody in to clean all that out. So there's pointless to clean the house until you can get everything out. And then Miguel coming to my rescue again, my line bro, right? Coming to my rescue again. He's like, Hey, I got cleaners. We'll get it. Do you want to save any of that stuff? I was like, no, man, just throw it and take it to the dump. Like I, I just want my house, you know? 
And so um, there was some paperwork. They challenged the paperwork and then we couldn't move stuff. And it was just, they made it so difficult. But I think in the end, it makes you more appreciate it more. You know, I think that was the, the lesson that I got in life. Yeah. Yeah, every time you have to make these these sacrifices, that it make that's what makes it worthwhile, right? Right, right. Back back to the to the marriage piece. One of the one of the best things I heard about, you know, um, when people are having difficult times, they'll go to a counselor and they'll say, "Hey, it's just not worth fighting for." And the response is, "That's because you haven't fought for it yet." Right. It's not worth fighting for until you've fought for it. You have to put that work in. That's what makes it worth fighting for. Yeah. Look how much I've put in. So. That's really yeah, there, cool. There was a time my wife, uh, we, we weren't communicating well. Okay, let's go to marriage counseling. I was like, why? We just need to be honest with each other. Like, you can't be filtered. You can't have any of that. Let it out. Just let it out. Because that's what they're trying to do on their yeah. couch. And they're going to be like, okay. And so your turn, what is your response? Like, we don't need that. We just need to be honest with each other. And so early on, luckily, we had that. And now, you know, hey, I'm upset with you. Let's go to the room so I can tell you why I'm upset with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I'll, I'll make those changes or fix whatever I did, you know? Well, and the so primary, really the honesty is the big part. Yeah. And the primary um, reason for the counselor is just to make sure everybody's being fair. Right. Right. It's right. like, Hey, you can, you can be mad, but you got to be fair. You can't, you can't, yeah. can't bring a bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you can't dominate the conversation. Right. Cause when you're upset, you want to just, da, 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 da. it's my turn. Yeah. Oh, you got to take turns. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. We, uh, we take that that skill that we learned together and we bring it to the kids. And so we, you know, we have signs like if uh, it's I probably share it too much, but if someone's upset in a conversation you, and you, you do this, that means conversation's over. Everyone stops. You got to take a break. Go get some water, come back, give that person a chance to kind of catch up on what's going on, you know? Yeah. Dealing with teenagers, uh, you know, we used to do this weekly check in to make sure and we're still doing it with my son probably less with him because I'm with him all the time. I know what's going on in his life, but uh, you know, you, you're checking in just to make sure. And there'll be times she was upset and not, maybe not at us, but just upset. Like, let me gather myself a time out. Okay. Let us know when you're ready to continue or, you know, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's um, we've taken skills that we learn with each other and, and pass them on to the kids in the house. And it's the house rules, you know, and house money. We, we really talk about, this house is kind of crazy how we fought for this house so much. And now we've been here 20 years now, I think mm -hmm. it is. Nice. The longest place I've ever lived. And it's this house, you know, so it's always about the house because I believe, you know, growing up and, and with my mom and kind of going all over the place and bouncing around and not really having stability in college and bouncing around kind of being lost. And then the, now having that, it's like, I wanted to give that to my children to have, this is the house, this is our home. You know, and and uh, her, you know, going to college, like, hey, I'm coming home. Okay, come on home. And now she's in Palo Alto. It's like, hey, can I come home for dinner? Like, you, you don't have to ask. Like, <laughs> come on down. You know, we got we got plenty of food for you. Whatever it is, if not, we'll go buy something. You know, but it, I always try to make it the house because I want them to have that for them for themselves. You know, that that sol solid base to return to. That is such a huge gift to to give to somebody because when you look at um, and so as I understand it, you're a you're a probation officer and have spent a lot of your career in, in, in as a probation officer. Oftentimes, when you're working with individuals who, um, let's say, have been getting into trouble, they often comes from come from uh, unstable environments where they're moving a lot or they're they're being uh, foreclosed about foreclosed upon or. or um, uh, getting kicked out of their apartments or whatnot. And, and so, and that can have traumatic uh, effects on a, on a young person yeah. for sure. Yeah. You know, um, you, you could talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. you could talk about Glasser's chaos theory, but it all boils down to, if you don't know where you're sleeping and where you're eating the next day, nothing else matters. Like, right. And, and you see, um, unfortunately, unfortunately I've had this job for a long time. Fortunately, unfortunately has been with these, um youth and adults that that don't have that that instability is really tough and i think maybe that is why it's important to me because i see what it or how it's destroyed other people's lives and how hard it is to get back um but it's, i've been talking to homeless or you know adults that are unhoused for years and you hear them what they're talking about and some of them are like i'm okay 
I'm okay. I know where my meal is coming from. I get a little check. I'm choosing to be out here. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. And it's like, okay. Okay. It gives me a different perspective of what I'm trying to teach my children, you know? So. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, crazy. Kind of crazy. But you know, the, the, um, if you go back, you know, I, I said I'm 50 and I've learned a lot by, from a lot of different people in my life. I could, I, you know, I, I try to learn as much as I can, even though I may put out that I don't, right. I'm, I'm strong. I'm, I don't, I don't need that. I really do try to absorb as much as I can from others. And there's been some very influential people in my life that really from that, that have, that have helped me. Um, Tony Valenzuela kind of took me under his wing. I think it was the summer of summer of 91 uh, for sure, uh, because that's when we were trying to do the national board. And then from that time, all the way into like 1994, Four, I believe it was before him and I had actually any type of headbutting and uh, the headbutting is he didn't want to open this, the uh, Santa Barbara chapter. And I did. And so, and I had the votes. And so that's why we did it. But that was the first time we'd ever headbutted. And so over the years, him and I, you know, stayed super, super close, but I really thank him for a lot of the molding that he did for me, like just teaching me, you know, business acumen and how to respond to people and he would see that I would get fired up and be like it's okay like you know, you know put his hand like on my shoulder or on my arm when we be in meetings like it's okay we'll, we'll work that out don't worry about it you know so a lot of that mentoring came early from that and I, I think a lot of the exposure and so part of you know someone asked me because I was you know national president just a few years back and they're like why why do you still do that even you know at this age that's a kids that's a college thing that's like it's not this is not a college thing for me this is a lifelong commitment and helping others build that their own lifelong commitment to something and opening those doors because of what I learned and I don't think I would be as successful or in the positions of hierarchy that I've been able to get through without the sandbox that Mac gave me to be a leader, right? right? Because it's a sandbox. You can go try to be a leader and try to do different things. And you don't really mess it up. And then you find out really how to do it. And then you take that and transition that into the professional world. Like, okay, I learned that. Man, man, how do you have so much confidence to talk to the chief? Well, because I've been talking to different leaders for a long, long time. They're human beings that want to hear A, B, C, and D. They don't want all the fluff, you know? And I really do believe. So for me, keeping NAC's doors open and keeping that opportunity for others to be able to use NAC um, for their own growth and then give back to NAC to keep providing that for others is important. It's really, really important to me. So yeah, I don't I know love if I your question or not, but yeah. You, you did. You did. Absolutely. Um, uh, but I want to hang on this subject for a while. Uh, talk to me about, um, so how old were you when you pledged? I was um, 18. Yeah, I think it was 18. It's a long time 18. ago. <laughs> and so that was, that was what, 19? No, no, because I pledged. I was born in 71. I pledged in 91. I was 20. Sorry. Okay. So, so 1991, you, you pledged. Um, and then uh, how many chapters? Because it started in 88, right? So how many chapters were there when, when you were pledging? There was only three chapters. Okay. So just uh, three chapters. So slow, most, slow San Jose and San Diego. Yeah. And most of us only had one or two classes. Right. So right. like, I think the first NAC fest I went to, uh, I think there was like 60 bros. And Not um, bad. Still. I mean, that was like a huge, huge percentage of everybody that was active. Yeah. Like there was very few that actually missed it. So that was kind of crazy, you know, to see now you get 60 bros. It's like, man, we have thousands. Where, where's the turnout? But So when when you're talking about uh, forming the national board, you were 20 years old, 21 years old? Yeah, I was actually, um, so I turned 20 in 91. So I was 19 when I crossed. We started doing the work for national board. It was Tony Valenzuela and uh, Jesus Oseguera had submitted two proposals for what the national bylaws would be and, uh, and constitution. And um, going into that meeting, it was 
I mean, at that time, everyone would go. Every active NAC would go to everything. And so we were just in this big room, this huge hall, and just at this huge circle table, and everyone giving their opinion, and it took forever to listen to everyone's opinion. And so there I am getting frustrated, and there, there it is, Tony putting his arm on my arm, like, it's okay, it'll work itself out. And I never knew what that work itself out meant until like four months later, right? And so we go through, everybody had a vote because that was like the big thing. Everyone's equal, blah, 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 everyone gets a vote. So we voted and we picked Tony's um, bylaws, constitution, structure for the board. And in that, uh, the part that everyone was questioning about it was that Tony had said, everyone that is at the meeting will become a board member. And I was like, there's just no way there's too many guys. He's like, it'll work itself out. Trust me, it'll work itself out. Because also in there is like, if you miss one of the initial meetings, you're out. I didn't put the two together because I was so young, right? So immature. And uh, it worked itself out in like four months. It, it whittled itself down to like 15 guys because people just stopped showing. It was too much. The commitment, they weren't producing the work that they said they would. Like it worked itself out. And there, Tony, you know, just sitting there like, I told you. But the <laughs> thing was, like, like you were saying, like, there was really no alumni. We didn't have alumni. We didn't have, we didn't even have really the older guys, right? Like, it was these guys that are still maybe in college, maybe just graduated in, in grad school. So there wasn't really adults, if you want, if you, if you will, like right. everyone partied together, you know, like mm -hmm. I go to I go to events, I'm not partying as much as everyone else now, you know. So there's a, there's a definite <laughs> gap. But back then it wasn't that way. We were all together. And so there wasn't any real guidance. And luckily we had, you know, Tony, who I believe was in law school at the time. So we had that. We had uh, Jesse Martinez. I think Jesse and Nick, um, probably two business minds that really helped kind of set that path. So the three of them. Then you had like Albert, who has always been the social butterfly, you know, and, and he was really focused on that and really identifying the purpose of social and what NAC was in that lens. And um, he didn't really care about the business piece. He, he was all about the brotherhood and building that. But Tony knew that there had to be a business piece, otherwise we wouldn't succeed. And so then you had um, Nick and Jesse in between, like working all, all those pieces out. So the four of them for me, and just my perspective, and I spent a lot of time around them too. So I didn't really see like Tony Ariola's input, but, you know, now knowing later that, you know, what he did. Uh, but for me, in that perspective of a young man, just kind of trying to absorb from them and learn what NAC was supposed to be, and why it was, and that there has to be a business side to protect us. And so it, it, it's wild to think of it now in retrospect to, to see Hey, if I was to start put that lay, lay a foundation for a national organization that's going to last, however, we're coming up on what, uh, what's that 30 something years. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't have picked a bunch of 21, 22 year olds <laughs> and, and, and I wouldn't have let everybody have their voice. Right. Right. And yet here we are, it, it worked out. Right. Yeah. There was a big change. Um, they, you know, they, when I came on, Tony's like, you know, you're, you're really good at the organization stuff, but you're also really good at the, the pledging piece. And I mm. it really was, I had a reputation. I sorry for it now, if you were ever a part of what I created, <laughs> you know, and um, it doesn't make sense. I'm completely against that whole thought process of what the way we used to bring members in now as a man and having a son that I just couldn't see that right now. But I, back then, that's what they wanted. And so, you know, we had some contact and they're like, hey, we're going to make you the national director of expansion. I was like, what is that? They're like, you're in charge. We got to, we got to grow. Like there's some organizations that want to, you know, start up our chapters out there and you're in charge of that. And so I was like, okay. And, uh, you know, that was, I mean, it was a bunch. I mean, it was just too much. And, you know, we, I opened the six chapters initially. Um, and it was a lot starting with Sonoma. And that class was a big class. And I was up there all the time, driving up there and back and trying to go to school. 
and actually ended up dropping out of school that semester because I my grades just suck, you know. So I withdrew, so it wouldn't hurt me, and um, just kind of crazy. Just a side note, we'll go, we'll get to this because it was a huge part of of what NAC is today, but also part of my life. Her name is Kalita McElroy. She's actually the Alpha Chapter's advisor now. Hmm. She was uh, probably after Liz in San Diego. She was probably the only other female advisor that we had when we, when she came in. But we'll get back to that. But she was, you know, telling me, "Hey Jay, you got You got to change. You got to do this. You got to protect yourself, your grades." Blah blah blah. So there was people that were very instrumental in in how I was doing things. And you know, you go back and you say, "Man, would you change it?" And you're like, "Yeah, I would do this," but you know, maybe not. Maybe not change that. Maybe you know, I found who I was by having those experiences and and some of those failures and having to face that adversity younger, and then having the people that were around me at that time in the right time at the right place, Tony, Nick, uh, Jose Herrera from San Jose State challenging me, like, what are you here for? And so I think maybe it was my time to kind of grow up a little bit in that period. And so when that grew, we grew big, we grew really, really big. And just all in one chunk, when we brought on your chapter, Fresno, Stanislaus, Sonoma, and then eventually Santa Barbara as well, like it was a big growth period um, that we went through. And that that really changed the face of what NAC now was and the potential to be a national organization. Let's take a, so actually, before we take a step back, um, let's talk about um, the founding of, of Santa Clara. So you knew, yeah. you knew uh, all these guys. How did, how did, do you, what is your take on how this started? Because I've heard, I've heard the other sides of the story. Okay. Um, <clears throat> couple different uh, lenses, right? You talk about the individuals themselves sure. and then the process because the process was a bigger barrier than anything else. Santa Clara didn't want attorneys on campus. Um, you had Berto and Sean who really wanted to bring that to their campus. And so we were looking at how we were gonna make that happen. You know, We were going to meetings and in force showing up to meetings, to the school meetings saying like, look, we want to be here. We're going to be here whether you like it or not. We'll go underground. What would you like? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so the original plan um, and what was happening was Berto and Sean were showing up to San Jose State saying, hey, we want to pledge. And so that if they became members, then they can go back to Santa Clara. They were already members and they can just start bringing classes in. That didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense at all because they weren't matriculated. So we're going to have to now, we're, we're picking a fight with our own school, right? Like we don't want to do that. So how do we, how do we get over that? And so we kind of pushed them away a little bit. Like, nah, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But they didn't go anywhere. They kept coming back. And so, and, and, and you've interviewed Sean, you know, Sean, Sean's my little bro, but you know, something about him is that he doesn't quit. It just doesn't quit. And sometimes I, God, just quit a little bit, bro. But no, <laughs> it, this has been him. You know, this is who he is for a long, long time. And it, and it worked to his benefit. And obviously now too, because he's very successful, but it worked to the benefit of all of you come. If, if without his passion to start an act there, um, we would have let it go. We probably wouldn't be where we are today with Santa Clara. And so we eventually just said, okay, we're just going to put you guys on the ground. And so they had a group and they brought him on. And so I was still the director of expansion at the time, but Candy was kind of the liaison. We, we had a liaison that wasn't me because it was just too much because I was doing so many chapters at the same time. So every campus that I had, everyone had a different liaison. Candy happened to be the liaison between them. And so, um, yeah, so we, we started the class and, and got them going. And, you know, it was different because we were trying to do big bros and Santa Clara being founding fathers. Like how do you have a big bro? And you're trying to figure all that out. And then some of the big bros that we actually did pick were flaky. So then, you know, it, it's kind of a trip for me. It works out great, but there's been, I, because I've been part of that process and some of those guys have backed out, I've adopted little bros that are founders because their big bro is kind of flaky or, you know, just didn't show up or miss the crossing or, you know, <laughs> I've stood in, but for me, I've built some great relationships because of it, you know, like John, not anything against his big bro, but 
that's that's my little bro like our relationship is that he calls me a big bro even to this day you know and so while sean is my little bro but doesn't call me a big bro because our relationship is different you know so it's it's just a trip man and that how all that stuff was kind of being figured out and we're just like okay let's do that and let's write it down because we're gonna have to document that and keep going forward you know so a lot of things that happen that are still happening today which is kind of cool because of longevity wise says it was a good idea except for the hazing stuff that we did early on um but some of those things that we like just try to figure out on the fly of crossing and okay what, what do we do what is the chant what is the process was the candle and this and that you know just all that stuff is like kind of on the fly and now it's stuck and then every chapter is have it have its own culture right and they kind of change it a little bit which is awesome but it all came from just really it was like four of us, myself, and then you know Walter, Candy, um, Pep, Viapando from uh, he was actually from uh, the founding chapter, just throwing ideas at me and we're like, okay, let's just try that, okay, and a lot of it stuck. So, and so some of the things you did were just four guys just thinking out out loud and trying to make it happen, you know. Well, it worked out for sure. <laughs> yeah. In some ways, there's some bad ways to that. <laughs> some of the stuff we did. Well, uh, is, nobody, nothing's uh, perfect. <laughs> right. right. T- talk to me about what made you decide to uh, to pledge. Who who was it that, that talked to you into or influenced you into wanting to join NAC? Because there was just the founders, right, at San Jose. No, we had the Alpha class. Um, oh, I thought you were part of the Alpha class. No. So I missed the Alpha class by a week. Um, so... Um, I was working at Great America uh, in security, and uh, there was this little guy that came on, but he was super, super funny, and so um, we kind of just kind of clicked, and so <laughs> Damian Trujillo, who is a, is a mm-hmm. founder from San Jose State, uh, he comes on, and we we just kind of like start meshing, right? Just like, dang, bro, this you're funny, and you're funny, and I mean, we would joke around. We were hanging out all the time. And uh, he's like, hey, man, he's like, uh, we're having a party. Why don't you come on over? I was like, I'm sure. So I invited my best friend at the time and a couple of the guys we'd gone over. It was a great party. And like, oh, man, what is this? He's like, I'm actually in a fraternity. He's like, this, these are a bunch of the guys from the fraternity. I was like, oh, man, this is really cool. And so then I met um, Beef, uh, Javier. And, you know, those two personalities, will they're infectious, right? Like anything they say sounds like gold just because of the way they, they present it, right? Best marketing guys ever, you throw those two out there because they're funny, they kind of bounce off of each other and they can make any, any situation seem like it's a blast. And so went to that party, went and hung out a little bit. They did some volunteering at a park painting. I was like, man, this is what I'm about. This is kind of the stuff that's cool for me, like going to a park and painting all the equipment. And uh, Damien's like, yeah, he's like, too bad, man. Like, he's like, we just put a line on last week He's like, mm-hmm. we don't do it for every year. I was like, ah, I'm not tripping. I don't, I don't need that. He's like, can I still help? He's like, right now you can. He's like, but soon you won't be able to because those guys, it's really about them. I was like, ah, that's cool. He's like, but next year for sure. And who knew that I would wait a whole year mm-hmm. and continue doing things and it being more in me. Like I was still, I still remember going to the park and painting the structures, you know, the jungle gym and stuff. And that being really who I was about at a young age and still now today, like making sure we get back to the community and give back goes all the way back to who I was back then. And so, yeah, I was supposed to be, well, I should have been part of the alpha class, but I missed it. And so I waited. And like I said before, it just wasn't me. I was supposed to be part of the beta class, you know, like it was meant for me. We have a big class, uh, the line bros the, you know, we didn't call each other line bros. I've adopted that these last couple of years, but my line bros back then were still very close and all old and crusty now, but we still, you know, see each other. And um, one of my one of my line bros, James, him and I worked together for years and we would see each other every day. And so one day we had a conversation like, bro, are we giving a handshake every day? Like, what do you do? Like, if we're in meetings? And he's like, yeah, that's what we do, right? And I'm like, thank you for saying that. I was like, but we're going to do fist. I'm not going to give you a handshake every time I walk by you in the hallway. He's like, no, no, we cool. I was like, okay. <laughs> but I mean, you had to have those conversations, right? Like, I see you every day, all day long. I'm not giving you a chance every single time I see you. But even for him, it was such a huge part of who he was. And so, like, his little brother works there still. James retired. 
but his little brother, um, he he still works there. And I remember him from when he was, you know, 11 years old. And he's like in super shape. And he used to be this chub, chubby little kid. And I always tell everyone, he hasn't always been like that. So you take all these experiences you have with Mac. And for me, kind of reiterating that that's why it's important that we keep Mac alive. So other people can have those type of experiences, right? And it, I, I wish I would have been part of a founding class. I wasn't. But then I look later at who I am now, it was harder for my name to be recognized versus those that we were forcing to be remembered. And so for me, it's a bigger growth that people are like, hey, have this guy, talk to this guy, talk to this guy. For me, that I, I cherish that now. I didn't before. I cherish that now more because I earned that. Like I, I mm-hmm. earned that, that respect, reputation, whatever you want to talk about, whatever word you want to use. Versus someone saying, hey, you have to memorize your chapter's founders and their name and their hometown and their nickname and blah, blah, you know, it, it, for me now, today, I, I understand it more as a, a growing man uh, versus being young and thinking that that title of a founder was everything. It's really not. I've opened more chapters than most founders combined. So, you know, I've had that experience multiple times. I, I get to keep enjoying that, you know, and um, sharing that. And that's important to me. Talk to me about what was it like going to San Jose State? Um, I know the Santa Clara experience, and I got to believe that it's different than San Jose, just like all chapters are, and, and colleges are different. Yeah, you know, I deciding to pledge um, at San Jose State, there wasn't a lot of options, right? And so I was a ball player. And when I first got to San Jose State, uh, I had blown out my knee. So I was supposed to play baseball. And so I, I was still being recruited by like, you know, you're some of your traditional white fraternities, Sigma Alpha, Epsilon, um, the Pikes, some of the, you know, bigger fraternities because I played ball with those guys, whether against them or on the same teams or travel ball. So I knew a bunch of those guys. And then I went to their events. I'm like, nah, this, this is not for me. I would go do their tournaments. Hey, we're having a volleyball tournament. Cool. I want to do that. So I'd do that. Right. But just being part of that, just, it didn't fit for me. And then when I met Damien and, uh, and Beef, their personalities were infectious. But it was the fact that, so we, we partied one day and we're super hungover. And they're like, hey, we still got to go. We still got to go to that park. That was our commitment. And everybody went. That's what made me pick NAC at the time. Uh, and then knowing it was small, like there was, I, I was going to have room to grow, right? Getting into college, um, I was accepted to Santa Clara, but I didn't have the money to do it. And I didn't want to take on all the debt that was going to be required. They offered a bunch of money in their, in their ways, but it wasn't enough to cover everything. And I'm like, no, man, I'm, I can't go into debt. Like I'm already in debt. You know, my life is in debt. And so I decided I'll just go to San Jose State because I wasn't even planning on San Jose State. I originally hadn't applied to San Jose State because I was supposed to go play ball down in Northridge. And so when I blew my knee out, all that stuff changed. And so now I, here I am reeling and getting special permissions to submit an application late to San Jose State because that didn't work out. Um, had already burned the bridge, had already said no to Santa Clara. So I was like, ooh, San Jose State's really my only option now. So I didn't have an option. Um, when it all came you know, down to it, I didn't have an option. I had to go there. I didn't have a choice. And so you know, showing up on campus, still being, you know, very young. I had a full leg cast because I had my knee operated on. So, you know, going to classes and trying to sit in classes and and auditoriums with this full leg cast, what an experience that was. But um, when, when it came down to Santa Clara, San Jose, because we were so close, there was a lot of talk that the culture was going to be different at Santa Clara than, than the other chapters we had. And there was some of that in the beginning. Um, we're, we're from Santa Clara. And, right? Like, <laughs> that sounds like Santa Clara, bros. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the way well, we're from Santa Clara. Like, yeah, but you want this. You want what I have. So either change that or keep on wanting, right? I mean, that was the way it is. So there was a little bit of that in the beginning. But I think as, as time grew on, they just both identified their own cultures. Right. Like um, I think John was part of probably a big part of that culture identity. 
Sean was initially, uh, but he, he kind of left the scene early. Berto wasn't as big because he was still playing soccer at the time. Um, but that was an event that really bonded us because I was a trainer for San Jose State. Berto was playing and we're playing against each other. And so that was that was kind of cool times, you know. And then we would play like sports against each other all the time. And we would win a lot of them because we would have Lolo trying to cover as a DB. It's like, come on, bro, you you four foot two. Like we're just gonna throw over the top of you every <laughs> single time, right? And so then we stopped doing it like chapter against chapter. We would mix teams. And then you would still see Lolo getting the ball thrown over him. It didn't matter what team he was on. Like you knew the weaknesses of those teams, but it was more fun that way than it was any other way. So John and I, I remember clearly John and I got put together um, on a team, on a football team. Cause we were playing softball and we were just, we were up by like 20 runs, super like, let's go do something else. And so the football was that there's that school right there um, by, by campus Washington Park is right next to it, and there's a school right there. And so we used to do a lot of sports on that field. I can't remember what it is. But John and I, we got put together on the same team, and it was just like, that's not fair. I'm a quarterback. He's a receiver, and he's 18 feet tall. Just go find Lolo, and we'll just throw to you the ball the whole time. And that's what we did. And like, okay, let's just go eat. <laughs> All right, let's go <laughs> eat. You know? So we did have some animosity in the beginning, and then we had a lot of events that um, brought us together because you're – you know, it feels like we're a mile apart, right? If you take one street and run it all the way there, you're going to run into the other campus. But I do think um, campus adversity really defined who we became as chapters because we faced different um, challenges. Like you guys were just trying to be identified on campus where we're trying to identify ourselves as a meaningful and powerful fraternity amongst these giants of traditional fraternity so we were facing two different things and i think that was probably a bigger dynamic in and how we developed and still knowing we have you you need this we got you so we would have a lot of sporting events on our campus that we were allowed to be a part of and you guys didn't have that because you're not allowed to participate for a lot of time and so then your athletes want to participate so they would come over and be on our teams i mean for volleyball for salsa classic i mean a lot of events that it became the San Jose Santa Clara chapters together representing San Jose State at San Jose State events. So that was cool as well. Um, but I think it was the adversity that, that we faced was different and that that's always kept us apart in some way. Love it. We're almost a, a, at a time and I want to be super respectful of your time. So I've yeah, got a couple. I, got all uh, day, bro. I'm old. <laughs> I do have a couple fun, uh, fun questions um, that I ask everybody. First one is um, five favorite artists it could be actors, musicians, authors, actual painters. Um, uh, author is Carl Hyacin. Um, he is, he was in politics when he was young and started re- writing and now a lot of his books are uh, these murder mystery, okay. but they're comical, man. He makes fun of like politicians and he makes fun of people equally across the board. And uh, his, his wit that he has in writing has always been very attractive to me. And so that's probably my favorite author. Um, Adam Sandler is my, my favorite actor. Uh, his comedy, a lot of people don't get it. <laughs> they just don't get it. Like, but he, he reminds me of me. Like, hey, I'm just this normal, ugly dude that's able to do a couple different things. Like, I'm nobody special. It's the what I put into it and, and what I get out of it is different. That's what I do it. So for me, just early on, Happy Gilmore, um, Waterboy, uh, so, 50 so first, 50 do, you take, do you take it back to his uh, comedy albums? I do. So, you know, I'll tell you, it's funny. We were going to um, NACFest in Fresno. There was four of us uh, from San Jose State driving, going down there. And of course, being being dumb, we were drinking. The driver wasn't drinking, but we were drinking. And so we had listened to music and then, you know, the radio station, like, to start tuning out because there's no stuff. And I was like, hey, I got this CD. It was Adam Sandler's first CD. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he sings they're, a little they're, bit. They're all going to laugh at you. Yeah, they're all going to laugh at you, right? And so um, I put that in. I think we listened to that thing like three times all the way through. And those guys are like, 
just dying. You know, the wheezing, the wheezing mm-hmm. one is like, mm-hmm. it's funny, especially when you've had a full <laughs> hemorrhage, right? And so, I mean, that, you know, I've, I've tried to influence others with that. You know, it's crazy. I don't let my kids, kids listen to that, but, um, you know, back then he was, he was a big part of who I was. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to send you a video I made of, uh, of my my baby i have a uh, a baby boy but he he got this onesie and there was a goat on it and so i over <laughs> I, I i just took a quick video and overlaid a, a some of some of the goat soundtrack on it. yes that's funny yeah um the, the other one is um i can't think of it now but the guy who, who the wheezing one right yeah when he tells him don't walk up the stairs i can't remember his name but uh, i'll i'll send you that one is probably the most funny for me so yeah, so favorite favorite uh, actor uh, is is that Stanley. And, yeah, and in movies, I I'm a big movie guy. I'll watch even the movies that have you know Rotten Tomatoes that are very small, just because <laughs> I'm into the movies. But I find myself nowadays really liking period pieces that kind of lay out the truth, but in some fictional manner with new actors. Mm-hmm. Um, I've watched like all these shows like on France and all those, you know, that period that the Vikings and all mm-hmm. those, you know, mm-hmm. um, I did do Game of Thrones, but it, I did it for the period piece more than the drama. And it was a good show. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you of all of everything, the one thing I've stayed committed to is I'm on season 42 of Survivor. I've okay. never missed, I've never missed an episode. So and, you and Tennyson. Uh, Oh yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. So now my daughter and I on Wednesday nights, wherever we are, or maybe Thursday because now you can watch it the day later. But yeah. she used to be in her little bouncer, and I would be watching the show. And so she grew up with that. So even now today, we watched it on Thursday together. Just That's I had fun. my phone just on my chest. I was laid down. We're we're sitting talking about what's going on, you know, and it's crazy how her being as educated, she has a complete different perspective and the characters that she remembers are completely different for different reasons. And, you know, her wanting to go on the show um, and talking about how she would do things. It's, it's a trip, but that is the one show I've stayed committed to for the whole time, man, the whole time. I don't even know why, because all the same stuff happens. It's just, it's different to see how it plays out. So. You, you got one more. Okay. I got one uh, more. What, 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 what? One more uh, uh, artist. Uh, what about music? Who do you listen to? Music. Um, surprisingly, um, I'm like a, a mellow music guy. Um, Eric Clapton, like gotcha. some of his jazzy stuff. Um, Erica Badu, some of yep. her more mellow stuff. Some of these newer artists, like her, um, <laughs> Billie Eilish, I like her tone. Uh, but then I go back to my couple of my, you know, favorite CDs because I still have them: Pink <laughs> Crows, um, "Jagged Little Pill" by Alanis mm-hmm. Morissette. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place, sure. but I'm not the rap guy. My wife. And my daughter can tell you every rap song, every lyric. Oh, the yeah, they're the hip hop heads. And the old. I still fall back into my freestyle. You know, I have it on the on the PlayStation, on the car, you know, you mm-hmm. station you hit it. But yeah, it's it's more of these um these younger artists that are more R and B, jazzy. I really I'm, I listen because I still commute to work. And so I put that on to kind of just keep me in the flow. Let me still think about what my day is, but kind of keep me mellow and not all pumped up or get all amped up I dig I, it. once in a while I still listen to led zeppelin and, and metallica but right not on. too often anymore you know <laughs> but no all country right. no, no country. country all yeah. right um five uh dinner guests dead or alive uh grandma uh, my maternal grandma is one for sure um wow five dinner guests dinner alive i think i'd like to sit down with obama nice um Jordan Spieth. I don't know if you know who Jordan Spieth is. The golfer? the golfer? Yeah. yeah. It's got a different perspective on life, and I'd really like to sit down with him. Um, I wish I could sit down with my previous self, like my nice. younger self, 
and just have a conversation. I don't know if I want everybody there, but maybe me and my just the two of us. <laughs> um, and um, I don't know, man. I don't know if I can get the five. But those are the ones that really matter to me. That counts. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is, that's good. That's good. We can yeah, do four. Yeah, I, those are the ones that pop into my head um, uh, quicker. I, I, I wanted to take you back to something about somebody I said was Kalita because you were asking. Yeah, about that's right. The advisor the from San Jose Foundation of NAC. So she was a um, she's a financial aid. She's a director of financial aid at San Jose State. But before she, you know, she had worked her way up. She was just the counselor that sat at the window. Just happened one day I showed up looking for some funds, help with funds. She was there and she's like, oh, let me look up here, your counselor. Oh, I'm actually your counselor. Let me help you out. Blah, blah, blah. So our relationship started really young to where today I text her. I'm like, hey, Slim, I call her Slim. Hey, Slim, this is what's going on with my family and the kids. My daughter got into Stanford. She was one of the first I text. Like our relationship changed. But I noticed back in the day, she was always helping people, always, always, always. And San Jose State went through this period of advisors or not having advisors that were strong. And I was like, man, they need somebody. Cleta is a black woman. She's, you know, from a black sorority and had a lot of experience dealing with adversity. And I was like, you know what? I knew Liz from San Diego and what she did for the San Diego chapter. I was like, these guys need something like that. They need a, a mother they're going to look for instead of a man that may have a toxic relationship with because of their own toxicity at home or trauma, whatever. And so I, we brought her on because I was the advisor, the, the alumni advisor at the time and brought her on. And she's been on now for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. It seems like forever, you know, she should have retired eons ago, but she's still there at school and she's you know up there and powerful and she still drops in on the meeting. So I think that was um, a big part of San Jose State's success of recent, maybe this generation versus our generation. We had some great advisors back in the day and then um, a couple of them passed and some just kind of moved on. And when I came back, I was like, man, we're, we're missing that. And I think advisors are a huge piece to our chapters. Uh, they 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 can be a huge piece, and a lot of our chapters are missing that support. But you look at um, uh, Stanislaus had a, a really strong. I, I'm blacking out on his name. That's why I paused for a moment. But they had a really strong advisor when they first came on, and we knew him from San Jose. And I really see the success that an advisor can do. And I, I bring that up because I think alumni fail to see that that they're really advisors, like. That is your role. You could be doing so much without having to commit. Go to a meeting, make a phone call, log in online, whatever it is. Because what you mentioned was we didn't have that to go to back in the day, right? And now that we do, we don't. We still don't have that. And I think that's a huge piece of what's hurting our organization is that alumni don't go back and engage because they still have this idea of, oh, that's a college thing. And I'm not in college. I have my family. I have this. And I just want to remind everybody that, you know, we did this for a reason so that it could keep going. But if you quit early, what is the message you're giving to others that it's okay to walk and keep this in your life, whether it be minute of just saying, I want to keep pushing. I want to keep being part of that positive marketing outlook. So next stays alive. So other young men can come in and have that experience, can have that ability to grow, have that sandbox to try different things to then help them in their, in their personal lives. Right. So that was a, a, a huge piece of what I think and why I congratulate you for doing this, because I think it's going to really ignite some of these older guys to see and hear what NAC and remind them of what NAC means to others, not just yourself to others. And maybe it'll be what you hear others say, what NAC means to them will motivate them to just do one little thing. Like a lot of people don't know, Sean, he, he kind of went off and became this entrepreneur and businessman, but you don't know that he's hired a bunch of NACs. He's yeah. hired a bunch of Lambdas. He's, you know, he's reached out. He's, he's really about it in his way. We mm -hmm. can all do that. You get guys like, ah, oh, I got a family. I don't got time. It's like, I got a family and I, got very little <laughs> I don't have time, time to, I don't have time yeah, either. It, it doesn't take a lot of time. It just takes a commitment to say, I'm going to give one hour a month. Like, come on, you got that time. Right. And yeah. so I, 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 uh, I congratulate you, man. I think this is uh, awesome. Ruben had told me 
you were doing this and he told me he was going to tell you to interview me and i was like no nah, man that's your that's you guys a santa clara thing i was like but it would be amazing if this became a huge knack thing and it just kind of keeps growing so i'm here to support you man whatever you whatever you need from me i'll help you i don't have any position anymore you know i'm, I'm done holding positions for knack I, I talk to the guys every now and then and offer some advice but young men like yourself i, I want to see keep surviving sure. and be successful <laughs> Uh, to you know, keep pushing you know, knack and knack has to grow. It's going to change. We have to be different, uh, and I think this is something different. And I, I, I congratulate you on your efforts to keep pushing knack's message. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, completely inactive basically since I graduated because I moved away. I went to Texas and Florida, and and haven't been in the in the Bay or even California. Um, and I did see this as just, I've always wanted to give back and I've made a couple websites in the past and the likes, but always wanted to make that connection. But just the, the proximity has, has been a challenge. But now since pandemic and Zoom and everything else, it's like, hey, this, this could really work. And this is a great excuse to catch up and, and to meet uh, other bros. And my goal with this really is, I mean, if I do 10 bros from every chapter, like I've got well over a hundred episodes and there's no reason why, and that's just barely scratching the surface. There's barely scratching yeah. the surface. And so I do, I hope to, I hope to grow this as, as much as, as much as folks want to see it grow. Um, and on that, on that um, uh, note, my last question for everybody is always, uh, so who should I have on the, who else should I have on the podcast? And with the stipulation that you got to help me get them because there's a lot of Dodgers out there, man. They <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I would ask you, what generation are you trying to share? Yeah, all, all, can, can, candidly, all of them. I, I love, yeah. I love, I mean, I love hearing from all the bros that it's not like I've ever had a dud, right? I mean, everybody's got a great story. So I think a cool one would be Tony Valenzuela because, I mean, he, yeah. there's history. Like, for me too, also, this is kind of a, a piece that Mac is missing is this historian, right? Like you're collecting mm -hmm. some artifacts, especially talking to dinosaurs like me, like you're collecting some artifacts and I mean, we're, we're going to lose them at some point because I'm getting old. I can barely remember yesterday, right? So this will be that that kind of record of what everyone saw Mac to be for them, right? But I think if you look kind of generationally, I think Tony really needs to share what Mac was about. Cause I think a lot of people don't really know that message, either Tony or Jesse, and I can get both of those guys for you. Uh, in between there, um, I think Arturo Olivas was, was a big part of that, that middle generation. Also having been um, the longest national president, he held the position the longest in our organization. I tried to, uh, to out, match him because him and I are boys, but I just couldn't do it, man. I was tired. Went, went through a lot in the three years, three and a half years I did it. It was just too much. And, um, but I think he would give a different perspective of Tony, right. And, and, um, Luis Avila being in there as well. He was very instrumental in, you know, just how we grew from that older founders into kind of my generation. Him and I worked a lot in there. I think that would be, and I can get you that one. I'll send you emails and addresses and attach Absolutely. Them. And then some of the younger guys, um, and I know he's not younger, but, uh, you know, and he's very quiet and he doesn't really like talk much as Jose, our current president, Jose Lara from, from uh, UC San Diego. Um, he's been around for a long time, man. So the things that he's seen and had to deal with that you want to ask, like, why do you keep doing it, you know? And so that, that would be a different perspective. And, and he's got a different lifestyle. He's a, I think, an IT guy down for the hospital system at UC San Diego. A little bit younger, uh, Brian Campos is an amazing young man. Um, he's been around for, for a few years, but I think he still falls in that younger generation. Um, uh, another one, Alan. Alan is from yeah, one of the, one of the, newer schools i can't think of it. it's it's not northridge but it's down there I'll, I'll i'll get you that too but i think he's another young man who has a different perspective what the organization has provided for him um so yeah i'll get you some names that's a, that's, that's a great list i'll take it i'll absolutely and you, and take you notice it. i didn't say any santa clara guys 
uh, I, I, I can try to get a hold of those guys. Those guys dodge me too, though. So yeah, no, you got you got all the good guys, man. I was I was cool to see uh, some of them and the younger faces I didn't know that I that I watched. But listening to John is funny. Uh, you know, John and I are still very close, and uh, but hearing his story the way he saw it, I, I there were things like, oh, okay, because my perspective of how he grew in the organization is much different. And knowing his family and knowing his kids, and you know, just. It's very different, but yeah, I I um I, I congratulate you, man. I really, really do, and I, I I will get you those to help you keep growing. Yeah, um, thank you for the, having me. Yeah, be the and first one outside the chapter. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Thanks for being on. But like, I got to uh, uh, share with John and Sean and Ray Esquivel. Um, uh, I want I want to thank you just the same, right? I thank them as founders because NAC fully changed my life. Absolutely changed my life set me on a path of, of becoming the man who, who I am. I love the term, the sandbox, because I've understood the concept and I, I understood that's what I got out of it. Um, mm-hmm. But I never, I never put the, put the terminology of having that sandbox of just getting to try out leadership and try out organization and try and, and um, putting, getting more, more responsibility than we warranted at the time. Um, uh, placed upon us and or and or taken for ourselves and you obviously were a huge part of that and so I thank you for that and uh, on behalf of all the all the folks that that came after you and all the chapters like I, I know this organization has changed so many lives and and so I don't I don't I, I would assume that you at least had some inkling of the vision that this of what it could be but did did you think that it could actually be as as big and as powerful and as impactful as it actually has become? Um, I was a dreamer. And so this is much smaller than I really thought it would actually grow to. Mm. And I know why it's smaller that we don't have the resources and that whole bit and taking away the, all the years that I did on the board, cause you, you're involved with that. I still thought that we would be bigger by now. Um, but I, it's okay. But this was we're we're at a place where I knew we could be, and I, I kept pushing that. And that's why I pushed all those chapters right away. That's why even Santa Barbara who wasn't in favor at the time. Um, I wanted them to come on because I saw what they could provide for us. And it's unfortunate that chapter is still remains closed, uh, but we're going to have that. And that was something I learned from a, um, one of the advisors from a real big fraternity back East. I can't remember what it was, but I was at a, at a meeting. He's like, you're going to have closure and you're going to have openings. You just got to keep, keep going. You're just going to go through it. And some of those closures are going to reopen and some of those openings are going to close. Like you, that's just part of this cycle that we have. And they had been around since early 1900s, you know? So you, of course you're going to listen to them because they've been through everything. Right. Well, and from that perspective, we're still a baby organization. We, we really are. I mean, we haven't been around a long time at all. And so you hear that. And, it, and then I look at my own life, um, but there were things that happened. Like you asked, like, did I envision this? There were things that happened for me that I wanted to always happen. I wanted not to be a part of my life without me having to be uh, participating. And so like when my daughter was on UCLA campus and the bros were like, hey, tell her to come on over, have tacos. She's good. We got her. She don't have to pay. I was like, no, no, no. We'll we'll donate money. We're like, no, bro. Like that's us. We take care of our own. That was very moving for me, you know? And then being on campus, going to see her, and then maybe run into one of the bros down there. You know, that was important to me. And so seeing that um, what was was integral, but I'll, I'll share why I went back as national president. Why did I come back out of, you know, a little bit of time of being away? And I wasn't seeing that happen for NAC, what I thought should still be happening. Mm. And I've never been that person to sit in the background and talk talk shit, right? Like, either you do something or just stay quiet. And so I was like, okay, I got to go because I don't like what's happening. And so I went and I was surprised that that I actually won president uh, with the amount of numbers that I did. Um, and I just saw us going in a path that wasn't sustainable. And we've been on that path for quite a while. We're still a little bit there and we need to grow and change. Um, otherwise, we're going to start facing that challenge of how do we not die? Um, and it's going to take things like this of people to share what that story is about what NAC really means. It's not just it's about the parties and this event. And let me mark off the check boxes every semester or quarter. There has to be purpose and reason behind it. 
And we also have to change how we look at what being in an all-male organization is about. Because a lot of us bring in trauma and toxic relationships, and then we don't know how to respond or behave with others. And so and not just opposite gender or same gender in intimate partner type relationships. In just relationships alone, men, men trying to deal with problems like we got to learn that there's okay to have differences, but when the group selects this, you still need to support that. You you just because you didn't your vote didn't count that day, you're still part of this and you've got to push forward with that because that's what the majority thinks. And we don't have a lot of that right now. And I I hope to see that um, return and be instilled again. So is it what I envisioned? Yes. Could it have been more? Did I want more? Yes. But I'm okay with where we're at as long as we keep growing and don't keep losing numbers because we're losing numbers. And so I think it's important that things like this keep happening. So some of these young guys can see like, man, I'm, I'm fighting to keep his dream alive or your dream alive or John's dream alive, whatever it is, whoever it is, hopefully someone motivates them that you interview so they can say, I want to keep pushing for that guy. And so um, I, I hope that's the message that I was able to relay to whoever watches. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you so yeah. much. And I look forward to seeing that list. Yeah, man. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Good luck. All right. Peace, brother. Thanks. Peace. Until next time, bros. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>